So first, let's just sit uh, quietly for a couple minutes. Let's still our mind. Draw our attention up there. Uh, maybe if you like, bring your attention to your breath. Think about uh, positive motivation, generate a positive reason, a positive motivation for engaging in the session. So it's good, you can um, at least generate the intention to, um, to bring about or generate the, well, the well-being of oneself and other uh, others, other sentient beings, your family, friends, strangers, other human beings, strangers or antagonists, and even other uh, sentient beings, animals, spirits, whatever kind of beings that exist who have a mind and are the same as us and wishing for, uh, wishing to be free from uh, dissatisfaction, uh, misery, pain, and wishing, and who also, like us, wish to have uh, satisfaction and well-being can generate the aspiration that um, whatever we do here uh, during this session, may it all become a cause for the well-being of oneself and countless other sentient beings. And also become a cause to free myself and other sentient beings from dissatisfaction, misery in this life and in future lives. So whatever way you have to generate a positive motivation, to take a a minute or two to generate a very vast, powerful, um, positive reason, good reason for being here, engaging in this session.
pause there. So, um, yeah, those are the first two. So this is introduction to meditation, this session. Um, so the first three steps, I guess, whenever we're doing meditation are first, um, get comfortable in our posture, which I didn't say much about, but you know, sit comfortably. And then focus your, you know, begin to focus your attention a little bit by, um, you know, letting go of your uh, discursive thinking about what's going on, what's happened before, what might happen in the future, um, you know, events of the past, events of the future, just let go of thinking about those. Let go of paying attention to things going on outside you in the physical space around. So stop paying attention with your sense, with your senses, with your ears, eyes, nose, tongue. Um, so as part of that, one, I mean, one part of the posture is to bring our gaze down, um, not, not looking out. And then, you know, as part of that also, then, so we're, we stop paying attention to what we smell or taste or see or hear. And we bring our attention like, within, within our own um, stream of consciousness. So we start to, um, at first we're not looking at, looking at what thoughts and feelings we have, although you can do that. But um, well, maybe you can start by just looking at how you, thoughts and feelings that you have. But then also start to disassociate from those, just let those go. And then focus upon, first we do some placement meditation, where we focus our attention on one um, single object. So there are many different objects you can focus on, on, but an easy one to begin with is the breath. Just watching our breath. Um, so then focus on the breath for a few minutes to generate some concentration. And then, um, then with that, generate a positive motivation. We just start thinking about why am I doing this? What, is the, what are the long-term aspirations, short-term and long-term goals that I have for engaging in meditation? And not only restricted to oneself and not restricted to this life, because if we're meditating for the purpose of just achieving some kind of satisfaction, some kind of pleasure for ourselves, just for ourselves alone, it becomes kind of a selfish activity. And for just this life, then it's just another worldly activity. It's not something that becomes like a cause for happiness that transcends this life or transcends oneself or leads us to eventual freedom from samsara. Um, so it's good if you can generate a kind of a more broad and long term goal, uh, motivation. Yeah. But um, I thought since there's so few of you here tonight, maybe I'll just see if what, what, what do you want to know about? <laughs> see if you have, why, why did you, what did you what, hope to learn? by coming here tonight. No? What are questions that you have? Maybe, I mean, what, what you have some experience with meditation already? A little bit? Yeah? Good. No? Not at all? So why did you come? Why, why are you, why, how did you get the idea that, oh, maybe I should go to a meditation class? Hope it make me sit still. Sit still? Physically, mentally. Yeah, yeah. You're racing around a lot? Most of the time. Okay. Yeah, definitely sitting still is a skill you can learn. What to just do again. Start, but smart, start with small periods, short periods. Don't try to sit still for one hour at the beginning and just be frustrated. Start with just you know, five minutes, ten minutes. But um, it's also, I mean, it makes it more difficult if you're just sitting still with no plan in mind. You need to have a plan. You have to discipline yourself. So you think, okay, first, that's why I'm explaining these steps. First I'll do this, then I do this, then I do this. So at each step of the way, you have something to focus on. So you're, you're not just, um, what do you say, you're not just ruminating about all kinds of things because that makes, that'll make you naturally want to jump up and do something in relation to those thoughts. So it's good to have, um, at first plan like your whole session, think well okay I'll try to sit for say 10 minutes. So you think during that 10 minutes then I'll, it's like I'll take a holiday. Everything else that's going on in my life, I can just put that all on hold for 10 minutes and just focus on whatever I'm doing in the meditation session. So already kind of prepare yourself that way to just let go of everything else. And kind of, you can kind of think of it like giving yourself a treat, you know? Like a little bit of space just to like, okay, I can stop thinking about the kids, stop thinking about work, stop thinking about shopping, stop thinking about, you know, I can just let all that stuff go. Give, your, give yourself permission right, to just let go of all those things for 10 minutes and just focus on your own mind. It's, it's a time to, um, yeah, look within 
and see what kind of um, what kind of inner um, um, needs you can have you have in a way. You know, pay attention to what's going on in your own mind and see if you can find some way to improve improve that. Do you have any experience meditating? A little bit? What, in, in what context? Uh-huh. Anu? Anu? Uh, yeah. It's a Nani meditation. Okay. I don't know. Nani is the left and the right. So, Shuna Nani. Okay. The left and right channels. Yeah. Chakra meditation. Ah, I see. Okay. okay. And you, what, where, what context did you learn meditation? I just went to Ramakrishna Mart and just uh, attended some class. Oh, okay. Okay. So I did it in New Kadamba tradition. Okay. In Malaysia. In Malaysia. Yeah. Uh -huh. Um, the problem is the, the mind doesn't just stay still. You try it and it just goes on. Oh, okay. Oh, it's good to hear that. Yeah, the problem is the mind doesn't stay still. It just goes on racing. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, that's very common. Because it's because, I mean, our mind has a kind of inertia. You know, like, um, um, but whereas, you know, physical things, they have an, an inertia, you know, like in space, I guess you think in outer space, if you, you know, you, you just toss a marble, it doesn't stop, it'll just keep going infinitely, right, because there's, if, because there's no resistance in space. So, um, whereas if we have a marble in a bowl and we swirl it around, because there's friction with the bowl, then it'll, it'll stop quite quickly, right? Because there's friction, there's resistance from the bowl. But our mind is more like the marble in space. With our thoughts, our thoughts have a certain inertia, and there's not much, if there's not much resistance to them, then they just keep, they just keep going and going and going. And the more we, we give energy to those thoughts, by, especially like, you can see easily, you can easily see with worry, like worry, or jealousy sometimes, the more you think about the thing that you're worried about, you know, worried about something might happen in the future, or worried about sick or something, the more we touch on that again and again with our mind, it kind of just it just keeps going and going and going. Even though at other times we're we're not thinking about that, we're thinking about something else, and we kind of forget it for a while. But then even when we meditate, we kind of still our mind. If it's still there, then it, it just comes up again to the surface. Um, so yeah, there's a it's common that experience people have when they're first learning to meditate that they feel like their mind is racing more than before. But the reason, the, the reality is not that actually we're thinking more and the mind is racing more than before. It's just that because we're stealing the more gross kind of forms of attention, like watching things and listening to things and, and reacting to things, because we're stealing that kind of gross attention then we're seeing all the, at the more subtle level of mind, we're seeing all the thoughts that are racing around that were kind of under the surface before. They sort of come to the surface. So it feels like, it can feel like, oh, there's more going on in my mind and it's not becoming still. But actually that's just part, that's part of the process of stilling mind. Um, so we just have to learn to be patient uh, with that. Um, seeing all the thoughts and like kind of patiently Almost like training a young a young child, kind of patiently bring our attention back to to the to the object of meditation again and again and again, let, again and again. Just let go of all those thoughts. But it helps to expect that right from the beginning. If we have the expectation that we'll just be able to sit and watch, you know, for example, if we focus on our breath, just watch our breath without being distracted for five minutes. You know, if we have a very strong expectation that we should be able to do that, then when that doesn't happen, naturally we, we, we feel frustrated, right? But if right from the beginning we understand that, you know, you know, sitting, just watching something, you know, something that's kind of boring, like my breath, or watching like a flower, a flower blossom, you know, you can't see a change in five minutes unless you're just looking at a flower. Um, if you just sit and watch the same thing, we're not used to doing that. Um, and, and rather we're used to just letting ourselves think about whatever we want at any, any given moment. So, of course, then we're not going to be able to you know, keep our attention focused there for very long. So if we have that, if we already have a realistic expectation, then it's not kind of so disappointing when we can't do that. But what we want to watch at the beginning, 
we need to ask the question, well, is it possible that the quality of my attention changes? Is it possible that, is it the case that, you know, if I practice for every day meditating for one month, can I extend the period of, you know, having good attention on the, on the object of meditation, so the breath, can I extend that from like two seconds to four seconds, for example? If we can see some kind of positive change through our effort, then, then the next question is, well, what are the limits of that change? If we keep making the same effort, you know, to keep our attention focused, then, then we can, and we see we can extend it a little bit, then it seems to apply we can extend it a lot if we keep, you know, making consistent effort. Um, but then the other thing is to see, well, what, what are the factors at play here? What, how, how do I direct my attention that I can reduce the distraction that prevents me from focusing on an object? And what are the things I need to do to, to or what, what kind of energy, mental energy do I need to use to direct my attention such that I can have better focus and better stability? Um, there's a factor of stability where we st our attention stays on the object and a factor of clarity, where how clear does the object we're watching, how clearly does it appear to the mind. Um, why don't we start with the, the posture? That's, that's where we start, because if you don't have a good posture, then nothing follows, really. You can't, you can't meditate well, because you'll be distracted by, by your body, right? You'll feel physically uncomfortable, so then you have to move around, and then, of course, your, your, your attention is distracted like, by that. So the whole reason for uh, meditation posture, whatever, I mean, we can, you can meditate while you're lying down, you can meditate while you're walking, you can meditate while you're sitting, you can meditate um, while you're um, standing, or you're sitting in a chair, or sitting cross-legged on the floor. So, but generally what's considered the best of those is to um, sitting cross-legged on the floor, right? So the reason for that is because um, when you're sitting cross-legged, you have a very broad base that you're sitting on. It's not you're only not only sitting on your on your buttocks or your thighs, but even your knees are touching the ground. And also, if you're sitting on the floor, if you're low down, then your your center it's like being in a boat. You know? If you're in a, like a, a rowboat or a canoe, a small boat, the higher your center of gravity, the more unstable you are. So the lower center of gravity you are, then the more stable you are in the boat. So similarly on the floor, like when you're sitting low on the floor. Then um, you know. Then then you're more. You naturally feel more stable, right? Um, so that's the purpose. But if you're sitting in a, in a chair, then um, yeah, it's just you just kind of similarly want to have as stable a position. Like yeah, like with your feet flat on the floor, um, and um, yeah, sitting in the chair. And, and so the next thing is you want to sit up straight, right? So when you're sitting in a chair, we tend to slump back, you know, so we don't want to do that. Um, it can help to put a cushion under the, under the, the back part of your, your buttocks and your coccyx to raise up the back a little bit. Um, but yeah, you don't want to you don't want to lean back um, too much. So yeah, so in terms of the posture, the best is if you can sit in full cross-legged bottom posture, which is most difficult for me, with one one foot on top of each thigh. The second best is if you can have like I'm sitting now, with one foot up and one foot tucked under. The third best is regular cross-legged position with both feet tucked under your calves. Um, so that's the, there's seven points actually in this, the, the, it's called the uh, Varachana uh, posture for meditation. There's seven points. So the first one is your legs crossed, you know, sitting on the ground. And then the second is your, your, your torso erect. Um, so this is probably where we spend the most time in looking at the posture, how to sit, is looking at our, how our torso is, how our, our, our back and our, our torso in general. So we don't want to be like, if, we're, if at the beginning of the meditation, for example, we're leaning a little bit forward, then as we meditate, we'll just keep falling forward. The gravity will keep leaning forward. It's similar with being too far back or left or right. So it's really important at the beginning to find the place where we're balanced, you know, to sway a little bit. Sway to the left and the right, and find where you're just in the center, and then sway a little bit to the front and back, and find where you feel, you know, there's a, there's a line at which where gravity of the earth is pulling you directly down to the center of the earth. Right? So if you're off that line just a little bit, then you're going to fall, like 
slowly, you're going to fall one way or the other, and then you have to correct. So um, um, it takes time to find, you know, to get a feeling where you, you feel like you find that place. But once you once you get used to it, you know, you sway a little bit, and you find that place where gravity is holding you perfectly, then you can quickly find it. And then you just kind of, you find that place, and it's almost like you're just locked in. Once you find, it's like you just kind of click in, and then, then you can relax. So a, a mistake people often make is thinking, oh, I need to sit very straight. And so they clench all the muscles. Clench the muscles of the back or the abdomen, you know, or the shoulders and think, oh, I need, to, I need to be like this rigid kind of ramrod straight. But then that's also not sustainable, right? Because the muscles tire out and they, they cramp and they start to feel uncomfortable. So another um, advantage of just finding this place where you're balanced is then you can relax, you know, and just let let gravity pull you down from the from your crown right down to the, the coccyx, the, the base of your spine. And you just settle, you know, settle down on your cushion. You let your shoulders open and broad, but then let, let your shoulders hang from your torso. So that's the the third point is the shoulders, actually. The shoulders broad and open. So the first point is the legs crossed then the, the torso erect and balanced. And then the shoulders are broad and open. So we want to have our chest. So in this tradition, when we breathe, we're not forcing the breath. We just breathe naturally. But it does help to have your lungs open, right? So it can help to take a few deep breaths at first to open up your lungs and kind of push your shoulders back. Because sometimes we tend to hunch, hunch you know, our shoulders forward. And then that closes the, 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 the cavity of the chest. So then you can't breathe freely. So it's good to push your shoulders back and then just let them hang naturally. But feel that you know your lungs can expand just without any resistance. So for that reason also it's 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 not good to wear like tight belt or tight um, anything that's uh, binding around your midriff, because that, that that restricts your abdomen from expanding when you breathe. And then the hands are in the lap. So there's different ways. I mean, you see the different images of the Buddhas around. They hold, they have different mudras, right? So they put their hands in different ways at different times. But this is this is called the, the mudra of meditative equipoise. Right? The mudra of meditative equipoise. So this is considered the best way to have your hands for meditation. The right hand on top of the left. So left represents wisdom. This represents the female side, the left and wisdom, and the right represents the male, male side and the method side of the path, the more active aspect of the path. So, um, method supported by wisdom, or the right hand supported by the left, and then just look, rest on your lap in front of you. Um, and then the tips of the thumbs touching, usually to make, a, make about a triangle, touching or an oval, whatever's comfortable. So to do this, sometimes, you know, there's a, there, there might be a big cavity in your, in your lap, or you know, your arms could be different lengths, so it should be, everything should be comfortable and relaxed, so sometimes it helps to like fold up a little towel and put it in your lap, and then let rest your hands on, on that, um, or a cushion, you know, to put something there. But then if that really doesn't, I mean, of course at first it's not going to feel comfortable, it'll feel unnatural, because you're not used to it. But, you know, sometimes, if after a time it really doesn't feel uncomfortable, you can also, you know, put, put one hand you know, on your knee, or put both hands on your knee. That's okay to do, like, sometimes. You can experiment. So, but this is considered the best. The best thing to do. Um, so we have, we have the legs crossed, the torso erect, the shoulders broad and open, the hands in the lap. So that's four points. Okay. Uh, the fifth point is the head. The head should be um, slightly tucked forward. The chin is slightly tucked in, and the back of the neck a little bit elongated, right? So it helps so that our head needs to be balanced on top of our, our neck uh, and our shoulders. So we don't want to have you know, the head kind of falling back or we're just falling down forward too much, right? So it's the same kind of, we want to have this perfect balance. It can, it can help to, um, one technique is to imagine like a golden thread, a golden string coming from the sky and its hooks it's kind of tied to our crown of our head right here, and we're, we're to the crown of the head, and we're hanging 
you stray down from that. But um, uh, basically it helps you have to tuck the chin and elongate the back of the neck a little bit so the head's a little bit tucked. And then it creates this firm kind of stable position in the head. And then the next, uh, the sixth is our, our eyes. So here it's, um, if we have our eyes fully open and we're looking forward, then we're just, we easily start, you know, be distracted by things we see. We get distracted by things we're seeing around us and we're kind of too stimulated, right? It's like we're naturally engaging with the environment around us, so we don't want to do that. But if we have our eyes fully closed, it's easy to get sleepy and fall asleep, get sluggish, right? So the middle way is to have, bring your gaze to about a 45 degree angle. Just bring your gaze in. Right? And, and, and without looking at anything, just let your, your eyes kind of, your, your um, what do you say, your line of sight fall at about a 45 degree angle down towards the floor, like along the ridge of your nose. And don't look at anything on the floor. Kind of pull the focus of your gaze back a little bit so you, your eyes are just resting unfocused in space. So again, if we're not used to doing this, it feels a little strange, a little uncomfortable at first. Um, and you might, sometimes you feel like you're, you're, like in terms of your eyelids, your eyes are all the way open, just that your gaze is down. But um, if you relax in that position, actually the eyelids also kind of half close. Um, so that's, that's considered best. But again, it's important to know the reasons for doing that, so then you can adjust, right? So sometimes if you're feeling really sluggish, then you can try meditating, you know, with your eyes fully open and looking kind of looking ahead, just not looking at anything, to help kind of brighten the mind or clear away the sluggishness. And if you feel really excited, like your mind is just racing and really excited and um, there's no danger you're going to fall asleep, then you can also try meditating with your eyes closed for you know, a few minutes or the whole session. Um, but the, the, what's considered the best position is to have the eyes just half open, half closed, and the gaze uh, falling out of 45 degree angle towards the floor, you're resting unfocused. And then another, I mean, another thing you can experiment with in terms of the, the eyes is sometimes putting the, the focus a little bit further out, and sometimes drawing the focus right in, like right up to the tip of your nose, and see how that makes a difference. But what's considered just the best is about one arm's length, or one meter, And then the last, so the seventh point, it can be divided into two, is the lip, the mouth and teeth, and the tongue. Right? So generally, the, when we're meditating, we breathe through the nose. Just natu breathe naturally. And then the, the, the jaw and the teeth and the lips, just let rest in whatever feels natural, in that position, in a natural position. Um, but then the tongue is recommended to with the tip of your tongue, just gently touch the roof of your mouth, right behind your front teeth. Um, so this prevents, if you meditate for a long time or in dry air, it helps prevent the mouth from drying out. Um, and also it's related to the winds in the body, making this kind of connection between the tip of the tongue and the, uh, just behind the front teeth. But that's, you know, that's considered the best. Okay, so just to summarize then, there's seven points. The legs being crossed or sitting on a stable seat, the torso being uh, erect and balanced, the shoulders broad and open, the hands in the lap, right hand on top of the left, the tips of the thumbs touching. Um, that's four. Then the, the head tucked slightly forward, that's five. Then the eyes falling at a 45 degree angle down towards the ground, but resting unfocused in space. Six, and then the, the lips and teeth in a natural position, and the tip of the tongue gently touching the roof of the mouth, just behind the front teeth. So, mm. so why don't we try sitting, just just sitting like that for a couple minutes, just focusing on the posture. Uh, and then, so I'll give you one more instruction to do this while you're sitting. So when we get comfortable, when we're you know at the beginning of the meditation session, the first thing we do, well. Yeah, the first thing we do when we actually sit down on the meditation cushion is get comfortable in our posture. 
So it can help to just think through these seven points is one. And the second thing is to scan through the body to, by bringing your attention first to the crown of your head and then looking down through all the parts of your body for any discomfort, tension, tightness, and then releasing it with each exhalation. But first, just, you know, just sit comfortably and think through these seven points. Try to feel your, your body settle into a comfortable position for meditation. And then um, let's take a couple minutes and scan through the body. <coughs> so we begin by bring your, just bring your attention to the crown of your head and um, get a sense of any, what sensations do you feel there, you know, at the top of your head. Do you feel hot or cold or smooth or rough or calm or kind of stirred up, agitated? Just get a sense of the sensation. Um, and then, so as you exhale, as you inhale, imagine you're, you're breathing in very rejuvenating, like white light, you know, with the air, the energy, you know, the fresh, fresh oxygen, the energy of the fresh air. And then you can imagine it has this kind of healing, rejuvenating property in the aspect of like white light. Imagine that comes into the top of your head kind of restores any, you know, damaged cells or um, um, nourishes that part of your body in whatever way, the tissue and the bone and the blood, so blood and the subtle energy of the body. You know? And then as you exhale, imagine any, any, um, any obstructive force, any harmful um, energy, any tightness or stress or um, anxiety. If you're kind of clenching the muscles, imagine that flows out in the form of like dark soot or dark smoke. It just goes out down into the ground and just merges with the earth without harming it. So there's that basic basic visualization with each, each inhalation. Imagine breathing in very nourishing.
nourishing, soothing, rejuvenating white light. And with each exhalation, imagine breathing out any stale, dark, heavy, toxic, kind of tense energy. So first do that in relation to the top of your head, and then gradually bring your attention down, right? Down all the way to the soles of your feet, step by step, right? So down to the, the forehead, and the brow, and then the back, and the back of the head, and the area around the, around the ears. And then bring your attention down to your face, especially the muscles around the eyes, and the cheeks, the jaw. And then also, you know, below the ears and the, especially the back of the neck, the base of the skull, and down the back of the neck to where our neck meets our shoulders. We tend to hold a lot of tension there. So breathe in, rejuvenating white light. Breathe out, in dark. So as you, you know, as your attention leaves each part of your body, feel it just relax and feel very soft and kind of calm. Then bring your attention down to like the front of your neck, around your throat, around the shoulders, the upper part of the back, the upper arm. Relax the middle back, the chest, the arms. And the flanks of your chest, your ribs, on your rib cage, on either side. And then relax you know, around your heart, your solar plexus, and then down to your abdomen, your middle back, and lower back. Relax around the base of your back, all around your pelvis, front, back of your pelvis, right down to the base of your spine. And then relax your hip, all around your hip joints, and your thighs, and then gradually down your knees, your calves, ankles your feet, down your heels and toes and the soles of your feet. Feeling any tension, any stress or dark kind of toxic energy flow out with each exhalation and feeling your whole, your entire body this very rejuvenating white light with each inhalation. There. So you have any questions about the posture so far? On how to sit? So you can see when at the beginning probably you can if you're not familiar with this way of sitting, you can spend more time you know, sitting in a comfortable posture. I mean we spend quite a lot of time now, but for most of this is going to be explained. So when you sit in your you know in your in your own house in your, uh, tomorrow or the next day or whenever, try to remember as much as what I've said and just Go through each of the points one by one. Go through each part of your body and then do the scanning through your body. You can do short, you can do longer, as you like. And then, uh, and that way get comfortable in that posture. So then, once you're comfortable in the posture, it's best if you cannot move, right? Then not move your body. 
for the rest of the session. So once your body is comfortable in the posture, then it's time to focus on your mind and just let you know let your body just relax, rest. So you don't have to pay attention to your body, and you can just focus exclusively on what's going on with your mind. That's the, the purpose of the posture. Yeah. Initially, in your video, so, like the going to sleep. Yeah. Or, or you're feeling a bit uh, tired, or you're not able to hold your the position. Uh, one fidgets about sometimes. Yeah. yeah. Over time, it passes. Is that we just keep at it, and then the the practice, with practice it improves. We improve. Is that what happens? Yeah. Yeah. In pra with practice, it improves. Like how long after? How long does your like start to fall asleep. <laughs> so about 10, 15 minutes, not long. I'm fit, I'm okay. But we've been sitting here now probably 40 minutes. Okay. So that's it. quite a long time. Okay. So I would, yeah, at the beginning, you can probably keep the sessions shorter than the time it takes for your legs to fall asleep. Right? Right. But then, if you, I mean, if you, yeah, you do get used to more sitting, you get used to sitting in that position, so the, the, the time that your legs fall asleep becomes longer. Um, but yeah, if they fall asleep a little bit, it's okay. If it starts to become painful, then it's, of course it's a big distraction. But um, but with the fidgeting, I think the you know the just focusing on one part of the body at a time um, at the beginning, you know, focus on the legs first, then the torso, then the shoulders, then the hands. It kind of it should help. And then doing this kind of scanning where you're conscientiously relaxing each part of your body, that should help to reduce sort of fidgeting. If you feel fidgeting though, like, look at why, you know, why, what is going on. You, you can spend time just doing that. Why, is, where do I fidget? Is I want to move my legs or do I want to move my shoulders or do I want to move my head or, and where does that urge to move that part of the body, where is it coming from? And try to focus on that and try to relax more that specific area, that set of muscles or or even that set of thoughts, if it's related to some specific thoughts or something. Other questions? If you have a sprain in the knee or something, no problem is it okay? So what, we get back to this and again we can ask, is it okay? Yeah, yeah, it's okay. And how do you do it? You can also use cushions, you know, put under your knees to support. Uh, but you don't want to be, be careful that then you don't want so much that you're falling back, right? Okay. But you can also, it helps to, like, you know, you see how I, I sit here, I always keep, well, I'm sitting on one flat cushion, and then I'm actually sitting on another cushion, so the, so I'm raised up a little bit. So it helps, actually, I didn't mention this, but the seat you're sitting on, it's, it's better if it's slanted, or, or, or where your, or your, your buttocks are a little bit higher than your knees. Why is it so? It's just, well, sorry, it's just the physiology of the, the body, it just helps to have the back, the, your seat a little higher than your knees. It uh, just makes it more comfortable to sit. You can experience it. But especially, like, like, you have to be careful. Like, those cushions you're sitting on, the, the, the big square ones, they're quite soft. So naturally, because your weight is on your hips, so it'll sink more, and then your knees will be up, and then that causes you to start to fall back, which is not good. That's why we have the second red cushions there. So you sit on top of the red cushions, and then it's even better if you have you have like another cushion like this, and you just tuck it under the, just tuck up tuck it under your buttocks in the back, almost like if you're you're parking a car on a on a slope, you don't want it to roll, so you put a chalk under the wheel, because I mean the back of our, our buttocks is like curved, right? Okay. It's curved, so if we don't have anything under the back, different people's or bodies are different, but for many of us, like we'll just start to fall back. So if we put just a cushion just a little bit under the back, it's, it helps to make it even more like very firm. But the different yogic schools they say they sometimes they sit just on the flat on the floor. Yeah. Cushions, so yeah. So we try to get any aches and so is it to prevent that sitting on the base of the spine? A little bit on the elevated. Yeah, a little bit elevated. I guess it makes it so it's easy to sit without doing a lot of stretching and stuff. Because I know, I was asking, I, one guy who practiced yoga a lot, I was sitting with him, and he, he was just sitting on the flat ground. But then he was saying, because he clenches the, what do you call it, the, the, there's something for it, you know those muscles between the, like, between the anus and the, right, right, the sphincter, the, the sphincter yeah, like, right, if you clench the sphincter, he was saying it makes it more, you can sit more straight like that. There's different exercises and, like, stretches and stuff. 
I mean, of course, if you do yoga and stretches, it helps to sit more comfortably. Yeah, longer time. But, um, yeah, but if you have kind of your seat a little bit slanted, it helps also. Yeah. So that's the posture. Thank you. Yeah. Anything else? Uh, Archana, you have some that? I tend to fall forward. Mostly, I think, the neck and chest. Fall forward, yeah. So how do you try to rectify that? I just, whenever I notice, I get back. Yeah, it's kind of sick. You know, kind of do a little of that. Yeah. Also, that the neck, straightening of the neck, if I do, I, I get a little uncomfortable with that. Mm. Well, it's not like from here, though. It's more like, like mm, this. Yes. Yeah. Not, not back, just a little bit tilted forward. Shoulders. Yeah. Um, let's see. So after the posture, the next thing is well, the actual kind of meditation. Um, well, I mean, I guess I could add a couple more points. Before, I mean, before the posture even, you want to meditate in a place that's clean. In a clean, a clean place, in, where it's ordered, right? Because if, if the area that you're meditating on is full of clutter and dust, then naturally you won't feel, your mind won't feel clear. Your mind will feel kind of cluttered and not comfortable. So, um, so you, it's, it's recommended that like, you sweep, sweep the room first. Wherever you're going to meditate, sweep, sweep the room first and put things in order. Um, and then, of course, if you want to do some kind of, add some kind of religious practice, you can burn some nice incense, or make some offerings, offer some flowers or fruit you know, on your altar or whatever, um, you know, with prayers, because it helps to have merit um, to support your meditation. Um, and you also want to have the environment attractive, you know, attractive place, and you want to sit in the same place again and again. Don't sit in a different place like every time, because then it'll cause, if you sit in the same place, then your mind stops being interested in the things around, right? And you can focus more inward. If you sit in a different place every time, there's kind of, you know, kind of what's there, what's there, and what's going on in front, and you're more distracted. So sit in the same place every time. And don't sit on the same place that you sleep. Every place where we do something, it has the energy of the activity we do in that place. So generally, where, the place where you sit to meditate, don't sleep on the same place, like on the same bed, or eat, eat on that place. Or even read. You know, it's better you just keep one, one cushion, one seat, just for meditation, and that's all you do there. Um, if you can, that's best. Um, okay, so those are little things. And then the time when you meditate, like don't meditate after a heavy meal, because naturally you'll be sluggish. Uh, it's more difficult to meditate at the end of the day, because you're tired, right? So the best time to meditate is in the morning, after you wake up, wash your face, maybe do a little exercise, and then sit down and meditate. Um, that's probably the best time because your mind is quieted down from sleeping all night, so you don't have so much um, mental chatter going on. Um, and generally, if you, it's best if you can wake up early. You know, best is meditate before dawn, um, before the sun, you know, sun comes out. Um, but generally, in the morning, you know, things are more quiet. Right? Um, but then, yeah, it's also it's good to meditate you know, several times a day. You can at least in the morning, but also at night. Um, it's not. I mean, after watching like TV or looking at a screen a lot on your, your phone or computer, naturally the you know the bright light, the light it stirs up your mind a lot. So it's going to cause. And if you're reading the newspaper or reading about all kinds of things, naturally it'll cause a lot of thoughts to arise. So it'll be more difficult to meditate. So it's better if you can. You know, maybe if you're going to meditate before you go to bed, maybe for one hour before that, don't look at a screen. I mean, in general, for even for your sleep, it's better, it's better, right, not to look at the screen. Um, so, you know, spend some time reading or talking or, you know, doing some, I don't know, some uh, cleaning up or whatever. Um, yeah, and then the meditation session, at the beginning, if you're new, it should be short, right? Meaning like 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes. So the idea is that uh, we want to, what we want to do is create a high quality of attention, right? We want to be we, we want to become habituated to sitting and meditating with a high quality of attention. So if we stretch the session to be very long, like at, right from the beginning, like 45 minutes or an 
hour at the beginning part because it takes energy to focus our, our mind, right? So at the beginning we'll be able to focus well, but then we'll get tired out, right? And then by halfway through we won't really be so aware of what we're doing and we're tired of trying to focus. So our mind is wandering more and more and more. And if we just force ourselves because we think, oh, I want to sit for half, for 45 minutes or I want to sit for an hour, if we force ourselves just to sit there with a very low quality of attention, that's what we become habituated to, right? So it's not a good habit to get it. So the idea is we, if we think from the beginning, okay, I'll just meditate 10 minutes, then it feels easy. And we can put a lot of energy in focusing our mind well during the 10 minutes. And then while it's still going well, we stop. So then if we stop, we have a sense of success because it's still going well when we stop. So naturally, we want to come do it again. If, we, if rather we force ourselves to sit for a whole hour, by the end of the hour we're exhausted and it's not going well. So naturally we don't want to do it again. Right? So, so just sit at the beginning, sit for a short time, but try to have a very high quality of meditation and just stop. At the, stop at the end of the time that you, you set out at, at the beginning. So, good. So you think, okay, now I'm going to sit down and meditate for 10 minutes. So you don't have to, don't count the posture time. Sit down, be comfortable, and then okay, for 10 minutes from now, I said, put a little clock by you. I always have a clock in front of where you're meditating. It's good just to keep track of time. And then, um, okay, get comfortable with the posture. So then the actual meditation is first you, uh, we can say, you know, there's four basic steps. First, you have uh, just focusing your attention, generating a positive motivation, then the actual main part of the meditation session. And then some ded a dedication at the end. It's four steps. So first, do um, yeah, just focus your attention for a couple minutes. Um, so this is called yeah. So again, first focus your attention for a couple minutes. Then generate a positive motivation. Then the actual part of the session, and then the dedication at the end. It's four steps. So the first focusing your attention. Um, is basically, it's called placement meditation. So we can divide all different kinds of meditation into two types. Placement meditation, or which is roughly analogous to, um, to shamatha right, in Sanskrit. But um, yeah, placement meditation means we're simply, it's much more simple. We're just simply focusing our attention on one object and holding it there without doing anything more, right? Without getting involved in questioning and analyzing critical thinking and imagining things without doing anything like that. We're just simply focusing our object on, uh, focusing our attention on an object. For example, just watching our breath, right? Without thinking, you know, anything or trying to do anything special, just, just simply watching the breath. So that's called placement meditation, as opposed to the other kind, which is called analytical meditation, where we analyze. And analytical meditation is roughly analogous to, um, Vipassana, 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 and I mean analytical meditation, I mean basically means we analyze, but actually there's a lot of other kinds of meditation that can be included in that category, like visualizing, you know, when we visualize things, it's kind of analytical meditation, or imagining, generating, trying to generate a particular attitude, generate a particular state of mind is analytical meditation, or even prayer, I mean pray is a kind of, because it's much more dynamic than just focusing our attention on something. Generating a very powerful aspiration that, you know, such and such come about, or such and such come to be a prey. It's also a kind of analytical meditation. So, analytical meditation, analytical meditation is a much more broad category of different sort of types of meditation. Whereas placement meditation is, is quite simple, um, straightforward way of meditating. And what most people probably think of when they think of mindfulness meditation, they usually think about it. it's a kind of place of meditation. You're just watching something, and simply just watching something. So within place of meditation, so here we're on the first step, just generating some kind of mental focus. Um, so like I was saying earlier, the easiest object, well, whenever we talk, whenever we talk about meditation, there's the mind that is meditating, and then there's the object that that mind is watching, right? the object we're focusing our attention on. So I was saying earlier that the, for beginners, the general object for, for placement meditation is, is the 
is recommended as the breath, watching the breath. It seems straightforward, but even there's different there's different ways to watch the breath, right? <laughs> right? Uh, there's the whole we can watch the whole cycle, the whole process of breath, breath. So we're basic, basically breathing through our nose. Um, so watching the breath as it comes, you know, in through our nose, goes up through our you know our our our, our sinuses, goes down through our, you know, our esophagus, fills our lungs, our abdomen rises. You know, as we inhale, then the, in, 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 the inhalation comes to a cease, and then there's like this period just before we start exhaling, then we start, you know, exhaling. Our abdomen sings, our, our lungs contract, this kind of warm, moist air comes out through our breath, or out, right? So, basically, you know, one round of breath is one inhalation, one exhalation. So one way to watch the breath is to watch this whole cycle, right, without watching any part of it, just to watch the breath as we so we're, again we're not forcing our breath to be long or short or deep or shallow just breathe naturally right? and you'll see at different times different days the, the way we breathe it, it varies um, but just breathe naturally and watch uh, for beginners it's, con it's considered easiest object is to watch the whole this whole process of the breath the whole cycle of breath <coughs> But then two other ways, I'll just mention, two other ways to watch the breath. One is to watch the point right here at the tip of the nose, the sensations just here, right? So not without watching anything else, just watching that part of the breath. So keeping the attention right here at the tip of the nose and watching this, this the changing sensation. So when we inhale, it's more kind of dry and cool. Then when we, as we exhale, it's more sort of warm and moist. And just from watching the sensations there, you'll see that some breaths are long, some are short, some are deep, some are shallow. All right, so that's another um, possibility there. And then another way to watch the breath is to watch the abdomen rising and falling. Keep the attention right here. And just watch as your abdomen rises and falls. But again, um, yeah, for, for beginners, it's recommended you start with just watching the whole cycle of that. But you can experiment with the other two. Try it. But in one session, it's better you just stick with one. In one session, don't just, you know, for a, a few minutes watch here, then watch here, then watch the whole cycle. In any one session, it's better you stick with one. And, I mean, generally, once you, you, you find you like one of those three better than the other, then just stick with one for, you know, at least several months. And, um, just try to, you know, if you change around a lot, that every time it's like you're kind of starting over with generating some concentration. What's your question? Yeah, how do you differentiate between mindfulness and meditation? Mm -hmm. and you know, the static meditation is sitting in one place and meditating. Mm -hmm. And also we have the same like, you know, when you walk also you need to meditate, or when you're talking to someone also you need to meditate. Mm -hmm. How do you differentiate that thing like between mindfulness and yeah. meditation static on and the time is gone? Yeah, yeah, it's a good question. I mean, generally meditation, uh, I mean, the Tibetan word for meditation is gong. Uh, gong. So it has the connotation of like just making your mind familiar with something. It's really difficult to define meditation exactly. What is meditation? So you said this is this is. Yeah. Yeah, mindfulness I'll come to, but um, so yeah, meditation generally means to make our mind familiar with something. But every case of making our mind familiar with something is definitely not meditation. Like that's too broad. Because like, we can be really angry at someone and just think about all their faults again and again. And we, we become very familiar with those, but it's not benefiting us. It's not meditation. Right? So I think meditation is something, and, and that, that would be more involuntary. Right? So meditation is like you, you voluntarily, you conscientiously or intentionally focus your mind on your attention on something again and again and again. And become, so you become familiar with the object. So we're watching the breath. If we watch our breath again and again and again, we become more familiar with our breath. But more importantly, we become familiar with the, the way, the quality of attention that we have, the way we focus our mind on the object, right? Um, so this, I mean, it, it, it becomes much more dynamic than just watching the breath. Because, like, we go on, to, we can meditate on love or compassion. So, like, meditating on compassion is, compassion is the observing the suffering that we are another person experience 
and then wishing you know, ourselves or others to be free from that. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's an attitude, right? But we can meditate on that by trying to cultivate that attitude again and again and becoming familiar with that, accustomed to having that attitude. So, um, and many other positive attitudes. Generally, in meditation, we want to learn to identify and reduce afflictive attitudes. Thoughts and emotions that bring us disturbance, that disturb our mind, that destroy our happiness, destroy our peace of mind. And then we want to identify and increase positive attitudes, right? Attitudes that, that, that bring us satisfaction, that are healthy and bring us a more kind of balanced, um, wholesome state of mind, right? So we want to identify afflictive or disturbing emotions and reduce those and then identify positive, constructive emotions and increase those right, in the long term. I mean, as part of meditation. So, mindfulness, um, yeah, I mean, mindfulness, it's not, it's, again, it's not a clearly defined term. Um, well, maybe I'll skip back. So the way I'm describing meditation, yeah, it's something that's most easily done. Why do we sit in a static way? Because then it's the most when we sit still, uh, there's the best chance that we reduce distraction. When we're walking, we can meditate while we're walking, but there's much more chance that our mind's going to be distracted by something. We have to step over the, you know, the crack in the, in, the, in, the, in the thing, or we have to pay attention and not trip over this, or we have to see if someone's coming in front of us or something. So it's much more difficult to really have a very, very tight focus, right? But, but it's not that we just want to give up doing that, because we do. You will see, if you, if you sit in a static way, you know, sit still and meditate, then you can exclusively focus all your attention just on your mind, right? But then as you become accustomed to doing that and more skilled at doing that, you become more aware of what's going on in your mind. Then you'll see whatever you're doing, you, you become more aware of what's going on in your mind, even while you're walking, while you're reading, while you're talking to someone, while you're washing or while you're cleaning, or while you're working. Part of your mind, you're, you're, if you sit still and meditate, you're watching what's going on in your mind, then even while you're doing other things later on, your ability to see what's going on in your mind increases. You become more sensitive to your own thoughts, your own feelings, your own perceptions, your own judgments, and whether you're having memories or you're planning about the future. Because if you look clearly at all those things while you're sitting still, then whatever else you're doing, you see, you're able to see those things better. Is it like our wisdom raises? Yeah, your wisdom raises, exactly. You increase wisdom. Uh, like, uh, we, we reach a stage like, you know, where we transfer from focusing on breath to emptiness, you know, which is a light on that. Yeah, so I mean, emptiness is a... Focusing on breath to emptiness. Well, I mean, meditation. meditation and emptiness is a kind of analytical meditation, right? So analytical meditation, I was saying, is much more dynamic. In this tradition, we mostly do analytical meditation. That's mostly what we're doing. This kind of like breathing meditation is this kind of, uh, well, I mean, the placement meditation is the label I'm using. Breathing, and so within placement meditation, you can focus on your breath, which I was describing. You can focus on your mind, just watching your mind without thinking. You can visualize an object, like visualize a flower or a candle or, you know, as in Buddhist tradition, we visualize a Buddha, but you can visualize anything. And then focus your attention on the visualized image. It's more difficult because you have to create, you have to generate the visualization and then focus on it. But, but, it, but because it's more difficult, if you can learn how to do it, you generate sort of unique strength you know, in your mind um, to be able to do that. So, it, it, yeah. Well, when you, when you generate a visualized image, one, one advantage of it is it's very easy to see the clarity. Because if the, the clarity increases or decreases much more subtly than with your breath. Your breath is quite a gross object. You know, it's a physical sensation. So compared to a visualized, Im a visualized image, it's much more subtle. Because it's something you're just creating with your mental consciousness. It's not something you're perceiving with your, like, physical, your body consciousness, like your breath is. Anyway, you can experiment with that later. But the, the point I want to make is in placement meditation, there's many different kinds of objects. But whatever object you choose to focus your attention on, the way you focus your attention is the same. You have an object, and then you just, well, actually there's two parts, but you, with one part, the main part of your mind, you just 
direct your attention towards it, like the breath. The main part of my mind, I'm just trying to watch the breath. And then a corner of my mind, 20, 25%, we self-monitor. We, we, where it's called introspection. So you, you watch to see, am I, am I still watching the breath, or is my mind wandered off to watch something else? So that's the kind of part that, so it's a corner of your mind you use to catch yourself if you start becoming, you start thinking about something else. Or even you can start to feel this like, um, uh, even before your mind, your attention fully wanders off to think about something else, you might feel kind of, uh, kind of that um, excitement rising. You know, so even before you wander off, you kind of feel this jitter, jittery or you know, excitement rising. Or, or conversely, you might feel lethargy. You know, you might feel your mind sinking, becoming more dull. So it's in this corner of your mind, about 25% of your attention, you want to kind of watch what's going on with your meditation. But the main part, 75%, you just keep focused, keep directed, keep your attention directed at the object. Right? So that's called, that's actually, that's actually what mindfulness is. Usually when, in a more technical sense, when we say mindfulness, we mean this, this main part of our attention, our mental energy, 75%, where we're just continually keeping our attention directed at the object and trying to keep an unbroken continuity of awareness of the object. That's actually technically what mindfulness is. But in, I mean these days, and then this other introspective attitude is called introspection. Right? So there's these two aspects of the mind. The main focus and then the introspection is kind of monitoring what's going on. Um, but these days in you know general parlance mindfulness is used for it's kind of almost used like as a secular way of referring to meditation. Right? Because meditation often has a kind of religious connotation. So people just say mindfulness. But usually, I don't know, there's all different kinds of mindfulness meditation. You know, watching the breath or just being aware of your mind, just being aware of the environment that you're in. Um, but usually mindfulness is not talking about like generating compassion, generating you know, loving kindness, thinking about emptiness. That's usually not referred to as mindfulness. Although in the technical sense of mindfulness being this aspect of your attention, keeping your attention on the object, then yeah, mindfulness is there as part of it. So there's two different ways to use mindfulness. Just the way you see it written about, like in the newspapers and online and stuff, talking about mindfulness, that mindfulness this. It's just kind of general referring to more or less placement meditation or like some other kinds of basic meditation. Or the technical way of using mindfulness to refer to the aspect of the mind that is trying to keep an unbroken continuity of attention focused on one object. Okay, so back to just these four steps of meditation. So first we sit and do some placement meditation for a couple minutes, just to focus, so we get comfortable in our posture. Then we sit and do some placement meditation for a couple minutes, just watching our breath or another object until we have some focus. Um, it's good if you can to sit until, you know, to be able to watch, you know, if you're watching the breath, be able to continually watch your breath without losing the object, right? So without finding yourself, you're totally thinking about something else and not paying attention to your breath anymore. So without totally losing the object, to be able to watch the breath for seven rounds of breath. It's right? um, good. Um, so that's the first part. Then once we have some concentration, then it's good to generate a positive motivation. So a positive motivation it's basically like just a, a, re, a wholesome reason for doing um, meditation. So, in general, I mean, and this relates back to the Buddhist idea of karma. I mean, um, um, I mean, also exists in Hindu tradition, but the idea that you know what, uh, when, why actions that we do, why why do they become like a positive karma or negative karma? So positive karma always means that it produces a result that is, that is happiness. The, the result, the, that is the ripening result of that karma, or the ripening result, is a pleasant experience. Some good fortune, um, some kind of satisfaction of well-being or happiness. So of course, you know, if we're doing meditation as part of a spiritual practice, our own spiritual practice, then we want it to be positive, right? Um, we want it to be something that's going to produce lead to well-being for ourselves and others. Um, so just the practice alone, 
can do that, but it becomes much more powerful if we have a, the more powerful reason we have for doing the practice and the more long-term goal we have in mind and the more um, kind of wholesome, I guess, reason we have and the more powerful it becomes. So if we just, you know, we're just meditating to think, oh, I just want to, you know, relax, then, yeah, of course, we can become more relaxed, but it doesn't have any kind of long-term meaning or significance and therefore it doesn't have any long-term uh, benefit, actually. So, um, for meditating in the context of our own spiritual practice, then, you know, it's good to think, you know, I'm meditating not only for my own, my own self alone, not just for me alone, but because, you know, everything, like one way to think, there's many different ways to think to generate a motivation, but one typical way to think is that, you know, everything that I enjoy in life all comes about through the kindness of others beginning with my parents, my teachers, you know, my grandparents, my extended family, my neighbors, my friends, and then even you know, all the food, clothes, shelter I have comes from people I don't know, strangers. Um, not to mention the very earth that we live on, the air we breathe, the water we drink, the food we eat. All of that comes about you know, independence from other sentient beings. So if everything in our life, you know, everything that we enjoy in our life comes about independence upon others, then naturally it seems like whatever we're doing we can have the intention, may this benefit others. You know, by doing this activity, whether it's meditation or something else, may I return the kindness of others. May I pay, repay that kindness. So may it be beneficial for others. So, and then as, as much as we can extend that, then the more powerful it becomes. Think about, may it benefit my family, my friends, my neighbors, even strangers, all human beings, animals, even those who harm me. May it somehow be a benefit to them. If we can generate that kind of attitude, then it becomes a very powerful, positive action. Right? And then, so that's in terms of like breath or scope. But then if we can think in terms of time as, as well, right? If we just think in terms of just this life, okay, I'm meditating just to have happiness this life, then it's like when we die, I mean, inevitably death is coming, we don't know when it's going to happen, then it's like that, that the continuity of that project is over. Right? Whereas if we think, okay, I'm going to die, but then after death, you know, the stream of consciousness continues on, so this is something you have to analyze and check what are your beliefs about that. But if, if you feel it's true that after death, the, you know, the, our existence continues on in some form, right? Then it's a good idea to think, may you know what I'm doing now, this meditation, may be a cause for my own and others' well-being and happiness, not only in this life, but from life to life to life, on up to whatever my highest goal is. You believe. You know, moksha, nirvana is possible. May this contribute to, may it, may it lead me to achieve, may it contribute to my achieving nirvana. I feel full enlightenment is possible. May it, you know, contribute to my achieving full enlightenment. Right, so think in long, long term. Your longest term, highest aspiration, whatever that is, may this, what I'm doing now, contribute towards that, right? So then every meditation session, it does, it's not, it's, instead of being just kind of scattered, haphazard efforts to achieve some undefined goal, it all becomes something that's contributing towards some more and more clearly defined, very long-term goal. Right? So it becomes more meaningful and more effective in that way. Okay? So that's the purpose of meditation. I mean the motivation, in short. So there's many, many different ways to think about motivation. But yeah, at least think beyond just your own selfish ego, right? We don't want our meditation just to feed our ego, our, our self-centered, you know, kind of um, small-minded attitude. Right? We want to at least expand beyond yourself and you know, be beneficial to others as well as yourself. And then, if you can, think long-term goals in the future, beyond just this life. Okay, so then you spend a few minutes on your motivation, or clear motivation, and something you can cultivate from session to session, think about different ways. And then come to the actual meditation session. Um, so an actual meditation session, yeah, you can do place if you do place of meditation, then it's the same as what you're doing before the motivation, right? Um, and then if it's analytical meditation, then yeah, there's all different kinds of analytical meditation to do. So, if you're doing analytical meditation as the main part of the session, then, of course, analytical meditation is part of a process where you have to learn stuff, you have to think about. I mean, when you're doing analytical meditation, you're thinking about things. But instead of normal thinking where you just think randomly about all kinds of things, 
you have a specific, you define your topic for that session, you know. Um, and you think about a, yeah, I'll give an example, give a, yeah, well, I mean, there's different ways to, to organize analytical meditation, but a good place, a good example place to start is just like, look at a problem you have in your life, like, whatever problem, you know, whatever, maybe in a relationship with someone, you have some kind of problem, or maybe you have a lot of anxiety, or maybe, you know, you have uh, some negative attitudes about yourself, or you know, someone else, or maybe you had an argument with someone, or look at some, whatever, you know, difficulties you're facing in life, and take that as your, so, but don't, don't take all of them at once, right, take one specific, say you had an argument with someone, you know, uh, or uncomfortable conversation with someone that's kind of disturbing you. So then, then you can take that as your topic of analytical meditation, I think. So there's different ways to think about it. First, you just want to get clear about, well, what, what am I experiencing? Look at, you know, okay, I, before I had the, that argument with the person, how was I feeling? Then I started talking to them. Then we ended up arguing. Look at the progression. And then I end up feeling this way. Like, so how, how am I feeling? Try to get more clear about it. And then, and then, then you go more deep into it. Why? What are the causes? What, what is it that they sense specifically that disturbed me? And how does it disturb me? And why is that disturbing me? If they would said that to someone else, or said that to me at a different time, would it have just affected me in the same way or not? So ask all these different questions around to try to understand the issue. And then, and then you might think, well, how can I, like, why are they saying that also? And you can look at the causes of your own, your own reaction but also the causes of their action. What's the history of why are they, you know, why are they arguing in that way, with, you know, saying that, and um, um, what, you know, what might have happened to them in, you know, in the previous part of that day, or previous in their life, or maybe could they have meant something else, or something, maybe did I misunderstand, or, so, basically, you, you, you take a problem, and first clarify, well, what is it, what, what am I experiencing? And then look at the causes of it, from the, from the other person's side, from my side, from you know, any other factors that might be involved. And look at the causes, and then look to see, is there any way I can reduce those causes? Can I do something to, to resolve the problems, kind of work towards a solution? Is there something I might be able to say to that person to kind of heal the, the disagreement that we had? Or, or maybe if there's not, is there some way I can just become at more peace in my own mind? about it and just agree to disagree and, or, or leave it instead of being, you know, continue to hold on to it, right? So, um, is there some way basically I can kind of reduce the problem? And then what are concrete steps I can take to do that? It's kind of, yeah, it's an example of the, uh, analytical meditation, but it's a good place to start because our meditation, I mean, just, just sitting in the posture, generating positive motivation, just focusing, doing placement meditation, focusing on object, all that is helpful. That's good. But it doesn't really get directly at the kind of problems that we have in life. So one good thing about analytical meditation is it's so dynamic. It's an opportunity to really think very clearly about, you know, different things. So one of the most important things to us is, you know, like our relationships with other people, our attitude to ourself, our outlook on life, you know, and, and the things that are bothering us. So we can use that, that time in analytical meditation to think about those things. For example, anger is, is one of the biggest, most, most disturbing attitudes we can have. So if you do analytical meditation on anger, try to first define uh, what is anger, right? But to do that, I mean, one way you can just think on your own, but it's very helpful to be informed, right? to read about. It. So this is where it, you bring in study, actually. Meditation on, on one way to look at meditation is actually it's the third step in a three-step process. Where the first process, the first step is learning about. You know, if you if you if you have, you feel you have a problem with anger, for instance, learn about anger, read about it. You know, what what is research done on anger in the in the different spiritual traditions, especially like in Buddhist tradition? What are what is what is the definition of anger? What actually what is anger? What are the uh, what are the different qualities of anger? The different characteristics of anger? The different varieties of anger? So one is to hear about explanations, what are different causes of getting angry, why do we get angry, and how do we you know, not get angry. 
So one is, there's a three-step process where we study, and we contemplate, and then we meditate, right? So the more, the more you've generated wisdom from studying, hearing explanations, the more understanding you have from hearing explanations, then the more you're going to be able to generate wisdom from contemplating, thinking about, in your own way. Right? So it's not good enough just to read something, you know, listen to a talk, or read something in a book, or read something online, and just accept at face value what it says. We should push back against it. So is that really true? What about this? What about this? What about this? If I was going to explain that to others, how would I explain it in my own words? Right? So that's all part of the second step, contemplation. So hearing is just being exposed to explanations and information. The second step to internalize that more is to contemplate, think about it in our own way, and challenge it, and put it in our own words, and give, come up with our own examples, our own analogies, so we get a better understanding. And then when we, when we, and then, and then, so the more we have the wisdom of contemplation, then the more we have to meditate on. So then, so from contemplation, I mean, analytical meditation can be just contemplation, but we can, when we get very clear insights about things, then we stop and just focus on those, right, and try to internalize. So the third step, meditation, is like a way of internalizing more things that were just at a more conceptual, intellectual level before, by thinking about it in a more deep, deep way, um, and, and with a more kind of subtle, at a more subtle level of awareness. Um, so, say we have a problem with anger, difficulty of anger, then it's good, you know, read, read about anger, learn about different explanations, different things about anger, and think about it. And then when you do analytical meditation on it, related to your own experience, okay, when is the instance when I got angry? You know, how how was that, how did it how did that experience develop? You know, start before I got angry, how was I? What was my state of mind? Then what happened? What the events that happened? Then as I got angry, then how did I feel? Physically, how did I feel? Mentally, how did I feel? What are the thoughts that went through my mind? How did my perception change? Um, so in what, when I'm talking about anger, what exactly is anger? Okay, there, there's one instance of anger. How is that similar to other instances of anger? When I've been angry myself, how is that similar to other, when I've seen other people get angry? Other people have been angry at me. Like, then what, what was going on with them? Was it the same kind of, when I say anger, you know, my own experience, can I see, how, how have I seen that in, you know, in, in um, the behavior of like my parents or my siblings or friends or other people or strangers? You know? what, what is, when we're talking about anger exactly, what are we talking about? And what are the causes of it? You know, different circumstances. And then, what are the what are what are the disadvantages of anger? What are the drawbacks of it? What are the and what are the repercussions? What are the follow-on effects from getting angry? So those are all like things to think about. And then we get much more clear idea as we have a more clear idea about um, you know anger, for instance. Then we get more control over it. Right? We become more aware of it, and then gradually we get more control over our own. So generally, that's the idea. Do you have other questions? I know one question I talk a lot <laughs> explaining. But yeah, so you mentioned yeah. about the first uh, four steps. Like first, you need to have um, attention, that is placement, or uh, uh, placement in the different mm -hmm. objects. And mm -hmm. second is you're generating the positive motivation. Yes. And the third is the actual meditation. Yeah. It can be placement or analytical. Or analytical is meditation, it, is yes. Any other thing? Uh, the, the last is the dedication. It's like making a prayer at the end. Okay. Basically, dedication is the same as the motivation, except one comes at the beginning, one comes at the end. So it's again thinking about your long-term goals for yourself, for others, long-term. What, what do you want to achieve in long-term? And praying that, making a prayer, like that whatever, whatever positive energy you've generated during that, med that uh, meditation, may it contribute towards that. I guess. So, uh, Steps. Like for example, you're going to start off with a 30 minutes uh, session. Okay. You start mm. off with 30 minutes meditation. Yeah, yeah. How much percentage do you do? Like, you know, yeah. like, you know how much percent, or 100 percent, mm. in this 30 minutes, or 10 minutes, let's say. How many minutes sure. of attention? Minutes yeah, if you're going to do 10 minutes, um, yeah, I'd spend like two minutes on the first step, generating some concentration. Okay. Maybe uh, two minutes on the motivation, a minute or two on the motivation. And then say uh, five minutes. On the main meditation. Yeah, on the main meditation. And then one minute on the dedication. 
roughly. Actual meditation is spend a lot. Oh, the most time. Yeah. Over a period of the next six months to one year, uh -huh. yeah, and we try to follow mm -hmm. all of this. Mm -hmm. What sort of uh, timetable do you want us to set? You mean the number of minutes, how do we start? Where do you think we will be a year from now if we are diligent about following everything? Um, well, yeah, the time isn't so important, but um, yeah, I mean. What sort of goals and, should we be uh, setting? varies from person to person. I think the goal you should set is not so much in terms of time, but more in the quality of your attention. <coughs> so if you can probably, you know, probably when you try to, well, yeah, it's difficult to define, but the easier to define is in terms of placement meditation. If you can just, probably when you're sitting now, if you can keep your attention focused on, say, your breath for even one, two seconds without it wandering off, that's pretty good, right? So if you practice regularly, then, you know, within six months, you should be able to see, I think, you could keep your, you know, some days that you could keep your attention for like five seconds. Maybe 10. But, but it varies a lot for different individuals. It depends upon your own disposition, depends upon your karma, depends upon just kind of your, yeah, your natural disposition is the main thing. Um, but um, uh, yeah, for some people it's quite easy just to sit down and just you know sit still and kind of watch things with their mind. For some people it's just very difficult, even after years, it's very very difficult. And some people just can't really. Um, but most people, most for most people they can they can do to some degree and they can improve quite a lot within you know six months. But I guess the pursuit itself is very beneficial, right? In material of, uh, I mean, some people may be able to keep it focused for much longer, someone slightly less. Yeah. Like but for the pursuit itself is beneficial for both. Exactly, yeah, yeah. The pursuit itself is beneficial. So, yeah, I mean, I mean, an easier, easy way to measure kind of progress is looking at how long we can keep our attention focused. But that's not the real goal, right? The real goal is becoming more aware of what's going on in our own mind, right? So that's really the, the measure of whether you're having success. Is even if you can't keep your attention focused for a long time, like without wondering, if you can become more aware of the positive and negative thoughts and, and emotions that you have, and you gain some more control. So when, you know, like for example, we use anger because it's a very easy kind of thing to look at. And it's one of the most destructive emotions we have. So for example, if you're meditating, doing analytical meditation in anger, then if you can see that you know, whereas before you didn't even realize you're getting irritated and upset until you're like, you know, screaming at someone or just furious. If you can, you know, if you meditate on it again and again, if you can see that you, you start to notice earlier that you're just starting to get angry and irritated, then you can catch it earlier, then that's huge progress, right? So it, because, because you're, you're, you've, you've spent time thinking about and trying to understand more clearly what anger is and just looking at it, then when it starts to arise, you already notice it before you're already like, you know, totally upset, right? So that's a kind of example of sort of quality of attention. Because the quality of attention that you've generated in relation to that is increased, then during your daily life, your ordinary life, you see it makes a difference, right? Or with, um, I mean, on the other hand, look at a positive attitude. If you Another, you know, a very nice, easy analytical meditation to do is just on loving kindness, metta, right? So in that case, you just, you, know, you first you generate towards yourself, right? So think, just think, may I be well, may I be happy. You can repeat the words, you know, uh, mentally to yourself, may I be well, may I be happy. And just try to sincerely generate that attitude, you know, may I be well, may I be happy, um, towards yourself. And then when you really have some sense of that, have increased that sort of sincere concern, intention for one's well-being, then expand it to another, maybe your, you know, your mother or your father, and spend some time generating with regard to them, and then other friends or family, and then strangers, and then you know, and even someone who is an antagonist, you have a really difficult time getting, with, getting along with. Gradually, so then if you spend time doing that over, you know, weeks and months, generating that, that attitude again, 
then if you see it, it arises more and more naturally. Even while you're not meditating, you just see people on the street, and you, you, know, you, you just naturally have the feeling, oh, may they be happy, may they be well. Or you see animals, and you think, may they be well, may they be happy. That generally, the words don't have to come to mind, but the, the concern about, you know, the, the quality of concern for another being, if that, uh, you know, and uh, yeah, they're concerned about their welfare. If that, you can see that kind of arising more spontaneously. When it does arise, it lasts longer, and it's stronger than before. Then that's, that's clear progress, right? And that's much more important than being able to keep your attention on, on an object, right? The quality, so reducing, like, the, the, the strength and the, um, the, well, one, reducing the, like, with regard to negative emotions or destructive emotions like anger, jealousy, greed, lust and desire, uh, fear and worry. So sometimes addressing those. And if we can see that we reduce, the, when they arise, they don't arise as strong as before. Or they arise less frequently than before. Or when they do arise, they go away more quickly. We don't hold on to them so long, but we can kind of let go and let them go more quickly. All of those kind of things are, are clear signs of progress, and you should be able to see a difference within six months. You know, so on one hand, when you're doing analytical meditation, it's good. You know, look at all the different kind of what 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 are the kind of destructive emotions that most afflict you, right? And try to focus on those, right? Knock out the biggest targets first, right? The most destructive things. Try to reduce those first, and then and then grab the other ones. And then also spend some time, you know, you can divide sessions three and a half hours. Spend some time on what are the positive emotions you really like to develop. You know, more compassion, more patience, more generosity, more you know, loving kindness, or more wisdom, you know, more neutral kind of wisdom. So look at the different positive emotions you can generate. And then, and then you know, pick one to begin with, learn about it. And then and do analytical meditation with that and try to increase it and generate that. And then over you know over several months you should be able to see it becomes easier and easier to generate it. So you can generate more quickly. In your ordinary life, you generate more frequently. When you do generate, it's, it's, it has greater intensity, it's stronger, and it lasts longer. So in the third step, uh, we would also follow that uh, these studies contemplate and meditate. Mm -hmm. In the, all the four steps, in yeah. the third step, the actual meditation, we uh, incorporate even these three. Well, kind of, but I, I was kind of indicating that just in the meditation session, there's you know generating concentration, generating motivation, then the actual thing, then the dedication at the end. So the actual is the meditation. So there, in the meditation, you do contemplation and meditation. But what I'm saying is, for the meditation to go well, you need to be you need to be reading outside the meditation session as a support, right? You need to be studying and reading. Because um, otherwise, you know, you, you go to meditate in anger. Of course, you have your own experience, but that you can help understand your own experience a lot by reading about, you know, research, you know, scientific research on one, but also traditional spiritual teachings about what. Did, Masters of the past, you know, Buddhist or Hindu or whatever, what do they say about anger? Right? Then don't, we don't have to recreate the wheel right, every time. Or what do they say? What do they say about fear or anxiety or you know, greed or jealousy? Learn about those things, and then that helps inform that. And we have to become without daily experiences what we are having. And, yeah. Uh, so we just like, ten minutes if we're starting off. Mm -hmm. So again, we have to go back to our past, like, you know, what mistakes we committed, like, you know, yeah. showing an anger, or, you know, like, what are the positive things we have currently, yeah. Yeah. and plus what we can tell them. So all three have to work Yeah. And then we to what positivity you have to us, mm -hmm. and what you can uh, convert the negative to positive. Yeah, but you don't have to do all three in one session. You can kind of, you know, one session spend more on, oh, this, this is really bothering me today, so today I'll meditate on this. Maybe I need to spend a whole week meditating on this. And then, you know, then other days or another week, then think, oh, I really want to, I see this person is so, like, so patient. You know, how can I be more patient? And then try to learn more about, and then try to practice, you know, generating patience in this situation. When, when are the situations where I lose my patience? And how could I try to be patient with that person or in that situation? And then try to, and then play act, you know? While you're meditating, you kind of imagine, okay, I'm going to go there, I'm going to meet this person, they're going to probably act like this. In the past, I totally lose it, but 
it would help, but next time I'm gonna, I want to try to be like this, you know, when I meet them. I just want to try to totally keep my cool and be totally like neutral and you know, not agitated. So you kind of practice in meditation. And then when you actually are in that situation, you try to follow through. So just let your diagnose it, plus you're having it as a medicine yeah. to your patterns. Exactly, yeah. I mean, the Buddha's first teaching is the Four Noble Truths. Right? When the Buddha gave his first teaching in Sarnath, he called it the Four Noble Truths. So basically, the truth of suffering is like looking at the problems you have, or the problems you have, the truth of suffering. Then the truth of the cause of suffering, why do we have those problems? Where do they arise from? Right? So I'm just taking that, that teaching down to like a small scale and to apply it to like, you know, our own life experiences. Look at what problems we have in, in your own relationships or in your own mind. What are the things that afflict you, that give you problems? And then why? Where do they arise from? Look back at the causal chain. They don't just arise from nowhere. They don't arise just from some random, like, random reasons. They arise for specific reasons. And then, and then the, the third is the, the, the third of the Four Noble Truths. The Buddha taught us the truth of cessation. It's possible to, is it possible? I mean, he says it's possible to eliminate all those problems. But we have to ask, is that true or not? Is it true? Like, and look at with the specific problem you're having in your life. Is it possible I could be totally free of that? Or not, right? And then, <clears throat> and then if, if it is possible, what are the concrete steps? The, so the, the fourth the Four Noble Truths is the truth of the path, the actual path to practice. What are the concrete steps I can take to reduce that problem? Right, so I'll just give an example of anger. If we, get, if we have a problem with anger, okay, I can see that's a problem in my relationship with this person or that person. I get angry a lot. It's very destructive in relationships, right? So that I can see, okay, how is it that I suffer? Other people suffer because of anger. Try to understand the truth of the suffering. And then the cause. Why is it? Why is that I get angry? What are the things that causes it for me or others or in general? So, because that helps you understand. If you don't understand the causes of a sickness, you can't really eliminate the sickness. You're only treating the symptoms. So to really un eliminate sickness from the root, you have to understand where is it coming from? Why is it? What is creating this in the sickness? Right? Because last week, Shantanu had shared that yesterday's discussion mm -hmm. about anger. She gave a very important word. Anger is just a delusion. You can add some more. <laughs> it's from Shanti Deva that he says in one verse, yeah. it's a difficult verse, but he says, it's like an apparition. Yeah. Yeah, Lama Zopo says, because if there's no enemy, then there's no anger. An enemy is a judgment. We, we, we create the enemy by deciding that, oh, I don't like this person. We create the enemy, and then we become kind of angry. But we create the anger, actually. That way it's like illusion. But we think... It's just something coming from the side of the object. But, um, but yeah, so we understand the problem, and then we look at the causes of the problem. Then is it possible to eliminate the causes or not? Right? The truth of cessation. And then if it is possible, then what, what are the actual practical steps we have to do, we have to, we, that we can take to reduce and eliminate the causes of the suffering, and then thereby eliminate the suffering. Right? So this is the Buddha's I mean, fundamental teaching. It encompasses all of the Buddha's teachings. But it's a very therapeutic like method for dealing with our everyday problems. And we can so when we're in the main part of the meditation session, that's mainly what we should be doing, is applying that method for reducing afflictive states of mind and increasing positive states of mind. <laughs> Sounds good, no? Yeah, it's very It works. I mean I tell you, it, yeah. it works. It's like yeah. and it's a very logical tool, right? In the sense. Yeah. It's very logical, yeah. And it doesn't have to be a religious thing. It can be totally secular. Yeah. yeah. There might be some uncontrolled problems which is not in our control. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Some other, other people's behavior we can't control. But we can control how we react to them. That makes all the difference right, for us. For example, a global warming when we're seeing the climate change is being done by our ancestors and, you know? Yeah. They messed up with the earth, so then we go to the problem. Yeah. There are something which we can control, just like planting trees and creating awareness and you know, yeah. all this yeah. stuff. Other things. Lobbying our politicians. That's not, it's not under our control. The whole thing's not under control, but yeah, but it's also, yeah, it's. If it, it's something you feel sad about it. So. Yeah, and you can feel helpless. Yeah, yeah, helpless. Like, totally powerless. But so it's helpful, that's why it's helpful to think, well, what can I do? And focus on that. 
what are the things that I can do? I can either write a letter to my politician or vote for this person versus that person or you know, talk to my friends or become a volunteer in some group or you know, just turn off the lights when I'm not using the lights or turn off the geezer when I don't need the geezer. There's little things, if we focus on little things we can do, then we feel the sense of uh, power. I mean, we, it's a success in relation to those things. And that, that leads us to another, another, another thing. Rather, if we focus on all the big problems that we can't do anything about, then we feel totally uh, kind of, um, I don't know, defeated. No. We want to have success. Okay, shall we dedicate? Yeah, so I'm going to dedicate. So think whatever, um, if you have rejoice or whatever positive energy we've created by our efforts together and how wonderful that is, how excellent it is. We've made some effort to do something good for ourselves and for other beings in the world, for the world at large. So think how wonderful it is and rejoice. So then all this positive energy, all this merit, we imagine gathered together, and we dedicate um, that all sentient beings everywhere, all the human beings, uh, especially here in Bangalore, in India, in Asia, in the whole world, and wherever, human beings, and not only human beings, all the animals, from the smallest insects, flies, and mosquitoes, and ants, on up to the cats, and dogs, and fish, and cows, whales, all the creatures on the earth, in the sea, in the sky, under the earth. Um, whatever creature exists that is the same as us in, in wanting happiness and well-being, and wanting freedom from suffering and pain, uh, whatever merit we've created may all contribute towards uh, the well-being and happiness of all creatures everywhere. Especially to those who are sick and to be healed those who are hungry, may they have nourishment and sustenance. Those who are thirsty, may they have drink. Those who are lonely, may they have friendship. Those who are homeless, without shelter, may they have shelter and homes to live in. Uh, those who, um, may all beings have education, freedom from violence, and the fear of violence and oppression. May crops everywhere be um, bountiful. And may worry, every warring among different tribes and countries and uh, religious factions everywhere come to an end. Um, in short, may all, all beings create, uh, treat each other with kindness and respect. And may all of our actions really contribute towards that. Um, and may, er, may all creatures be free from every form of suffering and have every happiness of the form of suffering. And may all of our actions now and in the future always only contribute to the welfare of the benefit, um, the welfare of others, ourselves and others, and never cause even the slightest harm. Stop there. So thank you all for